Doing Life Together, Part 3. Our, our subtitle today is, Where is God? Where is God? Um, and that, that's a big question. And that's a question that whether you're a Christian or whether you are unbeliever and you don't believe anything, you don't even believe in God, you, you, this is a time when we're saying, if there is a God, where is he? And so we want to kind of dis- discover this today and get into this and ask some questions because, as you can see from the titles that are on the page there on your screen, um, all these all these words, they pop out at us. It's a pandemic. It's, um, you know, COVID-19, short-distance relationships, how long we got to do this. Uh, we got to possibly quarantine even deeper than what we are. And if that, if we do, what does that mean? Uh, all kinds of things. There's some scary things um, going on where because people are scared, um, then scared people scare people. <laughs> and so, and they do scary things. And so we have to be prepared for that. I believe this is a time and a moment for the church where uh, the church can actually step up and do some things proactively before we need to correct things where we can proactively do some things um, where that we can take care of. In other words, people who don't know what to do, people who have no idea, um, because we know whose we are and, and whose hand we're in, we can have more confidence. And so we want to be leaders in this so that we can help others through this entire situation. I do want to go through a couple of, of the numbers and everything uh, based on the based on the um, um, information that we're getting from the CDC and, uh, and others. But if you can just look at this, and this is what makes it makes a difference here. Um, the, this is the updates uh, from uh, a week ago, January, a week ago, Saturday. Uh, Washington, well, not a week ago, January 21st, this was when we had our first patient in the United States, and it was in Washington State. No no deaths, one person, so January 21st. So that's basically about three weeks, three months and a week. But then one week ago, Saturday, we had 23,662 cases and 322 deaths. But then early this morning, you can see what we have in the United States 123,617 cases and over 2,000 deaths. So you can see that these things are still ramping up. They're, the, they're exponentially increasing uh, each day. They're almost doubling about every three days. Um, in some cases, maybe even worse than that. But those numbers, that's the reality. We need to be able to look at the reality uh, and still not be frightened to the point where we are panicking and not don't know what to do. Now, um, this is something that I shared also last week, and I think it's important because uh, I want everyone, at least that I can speak to, to please be careful uh, when, whenever you go out and whenever you do things because of the, the virus can live on other surfaces for periods of time um, on Plastic up to 72 hours, that's three days. Stainless steel up to a couple of days. Copper and cardboard up to 24 hours. Um, and even immediately in the air for a couple of hours um, if you're exposed to someone for a certain period of time. Like if you're basically what that's saying, if you're exposed to a person who has the virus uh, for about three hours, then you will probably, um, you can consider yourself exposed. And many of you are probably aware of this, but I wanted to share it and so that you can also share it. There's other information that I'll probably share as we get into this because there's so there's a lot of misinformation. As a matter of fact, there's information that uh, even scientifically they thought was true at one point and it's not true anymore. But let's get into this today. My question today is, is it wrong for us to question God? Or do you believe it is a sign of unbelief if you want to question God? That's the question. Is it wrong for us to question God? The title today is, Where is God? And basically we're saying, God, where are you? 
And is it wrong for us to question God? Is it wrong for a Christian to question God? Is it wrong for anyone to question God? Sometimes uh, the way we grew up, uh, we believe that um, we, we believe we thought that, you know, it was like a sin to question God, to ask God questions and to, to question what he's doing. But if God, want, I believe God wants us to ask uh, questions so that we can know him better. So where is God in all of this is basically our title today. Where is God in all of this that we're dealing with? Um, many of us, we started off where it just seems like it was something far away. Then all of a sudden, we have loved ones that are sick or have passed away. And many and many, and it's, I've heard so many people that I know that have gotten sick and passed away that it it's feels like it's devastating. Um, my aunt, a funeral that most of my family, a lot of my family here went to a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, they, she just buried her daughter, my cousin, yesterday. The funeral was two weeks ago. And some of that is all because of all of the stuff that's going on. And at the same time, her husband is in the hospital fighting for his life. And so um, I want to um, um, go through some of that in, in this message today and just how, how do we deal with this? So where is God in all of this? Sometimes we've heard people have talked about, you know, God wants to test us or we'll be stronger afterwards. And some of that's, you know, some of that's possibly true. But um, God, God is, is, I don't think God is testing us. I mean, and, and I don't want to just try to answer the question for you because if you believe God is testing us, then uh, maybe, you know, that's that's where you are and you can you know see if God is actually testing us and you can feel that way um, but I, I just want the questions out there so we can talk about it where's God in all this some of us believe that this is a plague from God for disobedience um, there's been so much disobedience all over the world and especially in the United States we feel like we're just ignoring God and God is finally getting our attention that's what some of us think and that's what some of us believe and that's fine too um, but that's not really what I'm talking about because nobody has all the answers but we do know from scripture that Jesus said I will never leave you in other words even if some of that's true we know that God is with us he said I will never leave you and we need to be able to bank on that and settle in our hearts on that and so uh, for those, some of us who don't believe in God, there is no God in all of this. <laughs> if you don't believe in God, you feel like you got, there are people who are thinking we're crazy for even thinking that God has anything to do with it or that he can do anything about it. And that's part of uh, the reason for this series and this question. Uh, there is no God in, the, in this, they're saying. So if God is all powerful, here's the, here's the question that some of the, uh, especially atheists, um, believe. And that is, if God is all powerful, then he that means he can do anything then if he can do anything that means that he can stop suffering and if he can stop suffering why is he allowing suffering so if god is all powerful and he could do something but he didn't do something he's allowing the suffering then then in their minds they're saying that that means god doesn't love us if he doesn't love us then that's not god so that's part of the argument of those who don't believe but i want to Im invite you to um just listen in uh, a little bit today because all of that's unsettling and then at the same time many of us who are Christians we're just saying just trust God just believe God and we're not giving people substance of how to trust God and what does it mean to trust God and if I'm trusting God and if God is doing this then why am I trusting him um, and so that's that's part of it so here's another question for you. Can you believe in a God or trust a God that you don't understand? And so uh, we need to be able to, I think we need to be able to understand to some degree, uh, be able to understand God. We need to be, some people feel like we, we, we have to obey God, trust him, even if we don't understand. 
And that's true. Even if you don't understand, you learn to do that. But many times there has to be some level of understanding before you trust. God doesn't expect us uh, just out of the box to be, be able to trust without him giving us some information about who he is. We learn to trust God as we learn who he is. So when people don't know who God is, um, we can't blame them for not trusting God. And so we have to do our part in, in that. So when, we, when it comes to this coronavirus, I, I, I want to explain some, some just where some of this comes from. First of all, the name comes from a crown-like spikes, and that's why you see the pictures you see. Uh, so the virus had the, that the virus has on its surface, that's where corona comes from. Corona is Latin for crown, and that's where this comes from, the coron- coronavirus, as far as the name itself. And the the uh, coronavirus is this isn't the first one. This the common human coronavirus they call mild and moderate respiratory symptoms, which even including the common cold. Uh, while there are some more severe types that cause pneumonia and even death, all of those are corona type. But then when we look at the numbers of what's happening now, we realize that we're dealing with something that's totally different than what we've ever dealt with before. Um, This was as of the 25th. We can see that in New York, 53% of the people who were diagnosed and that were positive were between 18 and 49 years old. That's in New York, 53%. And so that's that's a lot of young people um, that sometimes we've gotten the information early on where we thought that we didn't, it didn't affect young people as much. And so, which also could have given them some false, um, not just false hope, but um, they felt like they didn't need to protect themselves as much, but you do. And, and one of the causes they believe in the United States and Europe is because of vaping. And remember, this is a respiratory disease. And so if you have any kind of compromising illnesses, and it looks like in this case where uh, I don't know what the difference is in vaping and smoking that makes a difference, but obviously they feel like they, they're collecting data where that appears to be uh, making a difference. So how could God allow this? And if, if God is allowing this, how could God allow this? If, and in my own mind, the way I answer this question, because this is a question that needs to be answered, how because if God is not doing it, I, I definitely don't believe God is doing this. I don't believe God, uh, even if certain people disobeyed and even if our leaders disobeyed, uh, I don't believe God would punish everybody um, in that case. Although in Scripture, he did that at times when David was king, um, the people suffered because of what the king did. Uh, but how could God allow this? I don't believe that God is doing this. Um, and I played this out of my mind. I heard this uh, some time ago, but here's an example. If you were walking down the street in your neighborhood and you walk down to the corner of that street and there's traffic coming, you stop and you let the traffic go by and then you cross over, then God allowed you to stop, right? God allowed you to stop and let that traffic go by. Now, let's say that you walk down the same street and you get to the corner, but you don't stop and you walk right out in the traffic. God will allow you to do that, right? Right? (laughs) And so God allows what we allow. And this is where we are. Where I mean, in, in this, this particular uh, disease, and again, the disease, um, the, uh, the virus is, is called the, um, it's, um, man, I can't think of it. I, the, uh, the, yeah, the virus is something else. The, it, COVID-19 is the disease. Uh, the virus has a different name, um, but it's, um, and I, I can't think, I thought I put it in on the screen there, but I guess I didn't. Uh, but the, you know, God wants us to realize that we have some power in the earth and we need to use that power. Um, 
many of us at first there, there's been some misinformation at first there was a report that this virus was started in a lab and it accidentally was released or even purposefully released and it was on a website i, I went to that website and looked they've pulled it down since then because the the information that they were publishing was not peer reviewed no no other uh, scholars scientists had reviewed the information anyway it's been debunked um, so as far as they can tell from all of the studies that they've taken so far this virus was actually uh, it's a natural virus and so it's they don't know where it came from that's why we they don't know all of the things there is to know about it yet that's why we have to be so careful um, even when we think that it can only be transmitted from one person to another that's that's what appears to be happening but there are things that the even the experts don't know about this yet and they'll tell you there's things we don't know about it yet and so we want to make sure that we know who we are and know what we believe and know what we can expect from God and so today I want to show you some scripture of where God is in all of this where I believe God is in all of this and it, it'll probably be surprising to you the scripture that I want you to take a look at is it's in the um, in the book well in the book of Romans and so if you'll take a look at um, the book of Romans then uh, I'll bring this up on the screen for you uh, in the book of Romans the first chapter in the 18th verse it says the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now, this may sound like I'm saying that this disease is the wrath of God, and I'm not, I'm not saying this, but this scripture, needs. I need to read this to bring this into context with uh, what I am actually going to say here. And so in the 19th verse, it says, Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. Now, this is, the, this is Paul talking to the church at Rome. Paul wrote letters to many of the churches, basically all of the churches that he had planted. And Rome, the church at Rome was different because the church at Rome, Paul did not plant that church. And the, we really don't know, scholars really don't know who started that church. But Paul was excited uh, because he was hearing about them, he was hearing about their faith. And so as he heard about them, he wanted to actually come and visit them and actually add whatever gifts he could to support them and also gain from them. And so here, Paul is talking to them about regular people, not Christians, as they normally did in all the other letters, um, where he talked about, you know, you this is how you should respond and act in the house of God. This is how Christians should act. He's talking about people right here. And and so um, as he's talking about people, the next verse um, goes on to say that um, for, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities has um, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen clearly seen God's creation since the creation of the world God's invisible qualities his invisible qualities are clearly seen Clearly seen, clearly seen. His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. The point I want to make here is that, and he's saying being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. And basically he's saying, even if you don't know from some church, he's, God is saying, to the Romans church here that Paul is writing to, he's saying people 
actually know who God is and that they can understand who he is from what he has made so that people are without excuse. And one of the things that I had never really thought about when I read this verse is when he says the things that he has made. In other words, God can be understood from what has been made. One of the things that has been made, and let's, let's take a look at what's been made. The universe, he created the entire universe, not just Earth. Earth is just one spot. It's almost like a speck in the universe. But he created the universe. He created people, that nature and people. And people is, you know, the big deal that I'm, that I'm thinking about here when it says that he's created all these things. He's created people. We are made. And so when we say, where is God? And this is what Paul is saying to the Romans. God is in the universe. God is in the earth. God is in nature. God is in people. God is not only just in Christians. And I know that's a surprise to some of you, but God is not only operating in just Christians. God is moving and he's always done that. He's always done things through other people other than people who were uh, Christians and who were believers. God is at work and causing things to happen uh, beyond what we can understand sometimes. And here's, here's, here's the deal. God's grace and his gifts are not limited to just Christians. Um, think about all of the acts of coronavirus kindness that you've heard of uh, over the last you know, couple of weeks where you've heard of uh, people where they have, you know, they have done things um, where for others, where people have shopped for others, um, people have whatever acts of kindness. I mean, you can even share, you know, as you're there, you can type in and share as we move on with this. If there's someone in your neighborhood that's done something or you, if, especially if you've done something where you can share acts of kindness, that's God work at work in us. That's God moving in us. So when we say, where is God in all of this? He's in us. God is in us doing things. And we need to get a grip on the fact that God is in us. So in other words, we are the repositories of God's grace. And, and we need to share that in order for others to actually experience that grace. And so that's, that's the principle that I want to talk about. But here's an example <clears throat> in the book of Judges. And I used the same character a few weeks ago. Um, this is the character here is Gideon. And this is Gideon. Gideon was one of the judges uh, after, you know, before the prophets came. And so when the angel of the Lord here in the sixth chapter of Judges, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, Gideon, at the time that the angel saw Gideon and said this to Gideon, Gideon was hiding from the Midianites because they were just taking over their land, taking over everything, and they had to hide in order to get things done and to even have a crop, to have food. And so Gideon was actually hiding in a wine press threshing wheat. And so the angel came and said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Well, Gideon didn't feel like a mighty warrior. As a matter of fact, that's why he was hiding, because he didn't feel like he was a mighty warrior. But he said, when the angel said that to Gideon, oh, Gideon said, pardon me, my Lord, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Now, here we go. God is saying to Gideon to tell him that you're a mighty warrior. What does Gideon do? Gideon asked a question. So, I go back to my first question that I ask you. Do you think it's wrong to ask God or to question God? Gideon is questioning God here. Pardon me, my Lord. I mean, think about this. God says, you mighty warrior, you go and save my people. And Gideon says, pardon me, my Lord. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? In other words, he's saying, where is God in all of this? Where are you, God? Where are you in all of this? Same question that many of us are asking. God, where are you in all of this? Where are all his, and then Gideon goes on and asks another question. He says, where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? It's almost like he's mocking God here. He's saying, my great-great-grandparents, and this is 
great grandparents for for uh, Gideon. My great grandparents and all of them, they've always talked about this. But where is this guy? Where is he doing? What is he doing for us right now? Where's all these wonders right now that they talked about? Didn't the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? Uh, where 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 is he now? Basically, is what he's saying. But look at what God said to him. But now the Lord has abandoned. Well, before that, Gideon goes on and says, "But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian." So he's saying all the things that should be that God has promised and that don't seem to be coming true, and he's saying just the opposite. But here we are, abandoned by God, and God has given us into the hand of the Midianites, which is basically their life is gone. And there are many people who feel like that uh, with this situation where it seems like the whole world is under arrest of this virus. And the Lord speaks back to Gideon, though. And guess what the Lord said? The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Now, that's interesting. Because I believe that's the same thing God is saying to us. We're saying, God, where are you in this? And the God is saying, and God is saying to us, go in the strength that you have, whatever you have, go in that strength, save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? God is sending us. But look at what Gideon said after that. He asked another question. So is it wrong that question God? <laughs> Gideon asked another question. He says, Pardon me, my Lord. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. In other words, I am not your candidate for this. So how can I even be considered to be doing this? He's asking God another question. But then God goes on there where the Lord answered him and said, I will be what? With you. And you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. God goes on to say to him, I will be with you and you'll strike down all of the Midianites. Now, let's take a look at this. Gideon questioned God's power. He questioned God's promises. He questioned God's love. Now, that sounds like stuff that we'd be scared to do. But we feel like it when we go through some of the situations that we're going through, especially when it's something that we've never gone through before. But Gideon questioned God's power. He said, where is the God that my, our ancestors talked about was, you know, brought us up out of Egypt and the promises that he made. And in other words, if he cared, it seems like he'd be doing something about it. That's basically what uh, Gideon was saying. Now, here's what we want to look at. What did, what did the angel or what did the Lord say to Gideon? He gave him no verbal answer. And we aren't hearing any verbal answers either. <laughs> there are many people who are saying that what they think God is saying, but basically we hear no verbal answers. God has not given us any verbal answers. But what did he say? He said, basically, you are the answer. In other words, some, some of us think that... Um, you know, we when we say listen to the scientists, listen to the professors, listen to the doctors, um, we feel like we want to just listen to God and listen to what God is saying. Um, when I believe that the doctors themselves are an answer, the, the scientists, I believe scientists is an answer to prayer because we've prayed. <coughs> Excuse me. Because we've prayed. Because we... We've longed for God and we've asked God questions over time and pounded and pounded and pounded. And God is saying the answer is in you. You have the answer. We we have the answer. So we have the answer to our own problems. And so let's pray for those who are in a position to actually do something about it. Let's pray for those who um, can and have the expertise to make a difference. And let's listen to them. Continue to pray. If, you know, if God hasn't given us specifically anything uh, to do, then we need to pray for those who have the power, who have the knowledge, and who have the expertise to do something about it. God didn't give Gideon any verbal answer. He said, 
you are the answer. Basically, you are the answer. I'm the answer. In other words, we are the answer. We are the answer that we're looking for. We have to believe that God is in us. That's where God is. Where is God? He's in us. We have to believe that he is in us, working in us. Even those of us who are home and can't go to work right now, God is in us. We need to be figuring out how God wants to use us and what what he can what can he do with me with what I have so here's our challenge for today your challenge is to recognize that God is always always right here he's with us he's in us and he's working through us God is always with us he's in us and he's working through us God is working through us He's in us. We, we need to be praying for the people on the front lines. And this, it, it, this really is like a war. And the people on the front line basically are the medical community. You know, many times uh, in the Old Testament, when uh, Israel went to war, they put the singers and the, um, the people who actually gave God praise out front with the Ark of the Covenant. In this case, it's our medical community that's out front. And many of you, like me, have loved ones that work in that community, and we care about them, and we pray for them, but not just the ones that are related to us, that entire force of people, because many of them are getting sick now. So, so many of them, percentages of them are passing away because of this disease and because of they didn't have all of the equipment that they needed. Let's pray that they get, let's, whatever is holding that up, in many cases, uh, it's it's information that's not shared, but let's pray that that that's broken down because that's stuff that we can pray. And I believe that God can actually move on people's hearts and do something about God is with us. He's in us and he's working through us. And we need to allow him to do that, but never allow fear and anxiety to prevent you from being the repository of that grace that God wants to give to you. God wants to give you God, the grace that God has in you and your grace is different. Um, your grace is um, very unique to you. Your grace is unique based on what God is, you know, giving you to do. And not just your grace as far as your gifts. Many of you, um, many of you, you, the thing, the skills that you have are different. Some of you are nurses. Some of you are doctors that hear me. Some of you you work in that space, you're, you're, you're exposed to it. And so I pray for you and we pray for you and we all need to pray and lift those up, uh, especially those that we know and we can call your name so that we can actually allow the grace that's in us to actually be at work because God is using you. He's using me. He's using us to work through this. So never allow the fear and the anxiety to overtake what we need to be doing because we have we have the energy we have the strength we have the power of God on the inside of us through the grace gifts that he's given us and i believe this will segue us segue us back into uh the series that we were about to do anyway but one of the things that we need to look, figure out now is whether it's our physical space or cyberspace we need to think outside the box and figure out how we can help each other uh, beyond prayer, we definitely need to pray. But beyond prayer, how can we uh, do this beyond prayer? So let's think outside of the box. Let's do something different. Let's allow our minds and our hearts to just wonder and figure out what we can do to uh, be sociable without physically being together. So number one, here's some action thoughts that we can do uh, to actually um, take the challenge. Number one, stay connected. Stay connected to the source, first of all. In other words, if we're repositories, there's something being deposited in us. And so stay connected to the source and then see yourself as that place where God's goodness is being deposited into and actually flowing through. People who don't know God who are scared, people who don't know God who, uh, excuse me, <coughs> P 
people who don't know God like we do and can depend and don't know how to depend on him, we need to find ways to practice solitude, which is really just you and God. And that's really two different things. Solitude is you need to spend some time with yourself, too. This is a good time to learn how to spend some time with you. Many of us are uncomfortable being with ourselves. But you need to find some time to be with you and also to be with you and God. And then the next thing is to be with you, God, and your family. Uh, Many of us, we haven't had this kind of time to spend with you. I've talked to some of you, and you're taking great advantage of this time while you're spending time with God, spending time with your spouse, spending time with your kids, uh, learning how to do some things, Um, whether it's FaceTiming, whatever it is, figuring it out and and doing it, learning how to engage, although we're at a distance. So here's some thoughts. First thing in the morning, because I know since we're scared, one of the first things we'll do is we'll turn on the news. But first thing in the morning, do not start your day off with coronavirus news. (laughs) That's not the way you want to start your day off. Take something positive into your spirit and into your soul so that it can positively affect your body because you're going to run into things during the day. You're going to hear things during the day. Even if you don't turn on the news, someone's going to call you. You're going to get a notice. You're going to get, this is affecting us. It's all around us. And the closer it gets and the more people we know and we hear about, then the more, the greater the potential for us to allow fear to control us. So don't start your day off with that kind of news. Start your day off with something positive, with the Word of God. Start your day off with, I wish I had one of Thomasine's books in my hand to show you, but um, Thomasine wrote a book um, a couple of years ago now. It was published, Morning Manna, and there's something for every day where you can actually take a scripture. This, this will be a good time to use some Morning Manna to get your day started with, just to give you something positive to put into your spirit, to put into your mind, into your emotions, so that it can affect your body. See, I believe your body responds to the Word of God, but not just because it hears it, but because you keep putting it in there. It hears it over and over and over again. Your soul is affected by what you're saying to yourself as you believe the Word of God. Then your body responds to that. So even I believe even if you were exposed to the disease, if you believe in your spirit and you believe the word of God, you can speak the word of God and overcome that. And many, many people are praying whatever they have to do to overcome that. And that's no that's, that doesn't mean you need to tempt God and go out and say, well, I can touch it and nothing happens to me. That's like walking out in the street, um, you know, instead of checking the traffic. God will allow you to step out there. And so he will allow you to be affected. Um but you have to believe the word of God. I believe that if you are sick, that you can believe God's word and you can trust God's word to be deposited into your spirit, man, and into your soul. And it will actually affect your body. And so number two, practice physical distancing without social isolation. Now this is real important because we could take this to the extremes and Um, and not do some things that I believe God wants us to do. So we need to figure out how to do this. In other words, how do we practice physical distancing without social isolation? We we shouldn't be socially isolated. Social isolation is about twice as dangerous as obesity. Now, I was amazed when I discovered this. Social isolation, for you to just isolate yourself from everybody else, it's about twice as dangerous as being overweight. And here's here's the stats right here. Um, Social isolation contributes to negatively to the very thing that we need desperately during the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, And yeah, I did a retry. Other people must be coming online now. <laughs> I think I think we're back. No internet. 
quality bad. Man, I was almost done. But social isolation contributes negative to the very thing that we need desperately doing this time, which is a strong immune system. We need a strong immune system. And so what social, social isolation does is it impairs the immune functions and it actually boosts inflammation. In other words, when you isolate yourself, studies have shown that your immune system is breaking down and you begin to boost inflammation. In other words, we need each other. God designed us so that we actually need each other. Even if we can't physically be with each other, we need to learn how to socially um, be, go beyond those barriers and figure things out so that we can actually learn how to be together. That can lead to arthritis, type 2 diabetes, and even heart disease. And so... Um, So social isolation among the elderly, this is real important here. Social isolation among the elderly has been associated with an increased risk for dementia. So many of us, our parents, uh, if you're my age in your 60s and your parents are still alive and we're dealing with dementia and we're dealing with other things, social, social isolation uh, uh, contributes to that. And we need to learn how to actually... Um, do some things with our elders, do some things with those that we care about, do some things with people that um, that we love that are elderly. Social isolation among the elderly has been associated with increased risks for dementia. So that's very important. So if you know elderly people, at least call them, uh, teach them how to do FaceTime, teach them how to Zoom, teach them how to do some things where they can actually be a part of our life, even though we're not together. Don't isolate yourself from other believers. Although we're not physically gathering, we must learn to encourage each other through social media and text messaging, FaceTime, Skype, whatever it is, phone calls, Zoom, and all of those things. We have to learn how to use all of those things and whatever else is new that's coming down the pike. So this information that I'm sharing, you can download a copy from our Facebook page, facebook.com slash groups slash GTMUSA slash files. Actually, when you go there, um, you'll go right to the today's message, today's uh, PDF. I'll upload it as soon as we're done with the uh, streaming here, and you'll have that available to you. So as I close out, let's just remember, we want to learn how to stick together while keeping physical distances and we want to do that without falling apart. <laughs> and I think we can do it. We can figure out some more things to do. And I believe God wants us to figure this out. So again, remember to prepare for Easter. We're going to do Easter online. And uh, those of you who know other people who would normally come to church with you, let's get that all figured out so that they'll know how to 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 take uh to get involved and get online with us. And so I want to take the time to offer uh, some next steps for you. Depending on where you are and what you'd like to do, we want to invite you to take a step today, um, regardless whether you don't believe anything I've said, but you have questions or you believe and you're scared, whatever's going on in your heart, just let us know. So you can go, uh, online to our website, gtmusa.org. Click on contact and scroll down uh, to the area where it says contact us online and fill that out and submit it and we will respond to you uh, promptly. And so, um, again, if you don't already have our email, if we don't already have your email, please make sure that we have your email so that we can contact each other uh, throughout the week. And I'll give you a way to do that. But I want to pray for you. And, and I trust that you can have a good week this week. And let's implement some of these things. We'll be back Wednesday in the middle of the week so that we can um, do more engaging kind of thing and do more of this. And we'll try to do... Uh, six o'clock Wednesday. I think most churches start at seven. 
But as you can see now, probably when more people get online, and it's it's a known fact that the Internet is becoming more overloaded because more people are doing things online. And so let me pray for you. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for this message. We thank you for the word. We thank you for even the questions that Gideon asked. And we trust you. We trust your word. We know that we can ask you questions and we trust you for the answers. And I pray that you would bless everyone that's hearing us today to actually settle their confidence in you where we can give praise to you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Reach out to somebody and let them know you love them.